a topic called the blind heart. And uh, there's hardly anything uh, we need to say in uh, introduction. Uh, uh, I don't need to introduce uh, Sheikh Bilal uh, to you. Everyone knows who he is. So, Tafadal uh, Ya Sheikh. Jazakumullah uh, Sheikh, the brothers are taping, so they need just uh, half a minute before you start. We're ready, we're ready. They're ready now, okay. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. The Blind Heart. This title is taken from a verse in Surah Al Hajj, verse 46, where Allah says there, فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارْ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Indeed, it is not the sight which becomes blind, but the hearts and the chest that become blind. Ashanqiti, the author of Adwal Bayan, one of the books of Tafsir, Tafsir of the Quran by the Quran, he said that because the blindness of the eyes along with the sight of the heart is not harmful, Allah used this metaphor, and that is in contrast with the opposite. For one whose eyes are blind can reflect and benefit from the sight of the heart. Indeed, it is not the sight which becomes blind, but the hearts in the chest which become blind. Allah talks here about a particular kind of blindness. If somebody were to ask you, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen to you? A lot of people would say, to lose my sight, to become blind physically blind. This is amongst the worst things that could happen. Imagine you can't see anything. You have to function in the world without being able to see. However, the Prophet wasallam, he quoted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as saying, إِذَا ابْتَلَيْتُ عَبْدِي بِحَبِيبَتَيْ فَصَبَرْ عَوَّدْتُهُ مِنْهَا أو عَوَّدْتُهُ مِنْهُمَا الْجَنَّةِ عَوَّدْتُهُ مِنْهُمَا الْجَنَّةِ Indeed, if I test my creature by taking his sight and he is patient, I will replace them with paradise. If I test my creature, my slave, Abdi, by taking his sight. This is the worst thing we said could happen to us. Lose your sight. If he is patient, Allah promises to replace the loss of his sight with paradise. To be patient means that his heart has to still be able to reflect. His heart still sees what is right. He's lost the sight of his eyes, but his heart is still in the right place. He's still seeing what is right. What is right is that we are patient with the trials of life. Whatever Allah puts on us is for a good purpose. No matter how bad it may seem, no matter how painful it may be, if Allah has put it on us, it is for our benefit. If our hearts can reflect on that, can understand it, then 
we see. If our hearts can't, our hearts can't accept it, then our hearts become blind. And this life becomes wretched. Elsewhere in the Quran, in Surah Al-Isra, verse 72, Allah says there, وَمَنْ كَانَ فِي هَذِهِ أَعْمَى فَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ أَعْمَى وَأَضَلُّ سَبِيلًا Whoever was blind in this life will be more blind and astray in the next. Whoever was blind in this life will be more blind and astray in the next. What does that mean? Whoever was blind in this life, in what sense? Blind physically or blind in the heart? Huh? Blind in the heart. Blindness of the heart. If they have blindness of the heart, then they will be blind in the next life. As Allah said in Surah Taha, verses 124 to 126, Whoever turns away from remembering me will have a wretched life, and I will resurrect him blind on the day of resurrection. And he will say, Rabbi, Lima hashartani a'ma wa qad kuntu basira. My Lord, why have you raised me up blind when I used to have sight? And Allah will say to him, كَذَٰلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا فَنَسِيتَهَا وَكَذَٰلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَىٰ My signs came to you, but you disregarded them. So in the same way, on this day, you are disregarded. The hearts that are blind. And of course, when Allah speaks about the blind heart, He's not talking about the physical heart. When the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah la yanzuru ila suwarikum wa amwalakum walakin yanzuru ila qulubikum wa amalikum Indeed Allah doesn't look at your forms and your wealth. Instead He looks at your hearts and your deeds. Indeed, Allah doesn't look at your forms, your face, your shape, and your wealth. Instead, He looks at your hearts and your deeds. And on another occasion, He said, fil jasadi mudra, idha salahat, salahal jasadu kullu, wa idha fasadat, fasadal jasadu kullu. Allah wa hiya al-qalb. Indeed, there is a clump of flesh in the body. If it becomes good, the whole body becomes good. And if it goes bad, the whole body becomes bad. Indeed, it is the heart. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet ﷺ in his sunnah, he stressed the importance of taking care of our hearts. We tend to be more concerned with taking care of our bodies. How we look, the kind of clothes we wear, our form, our outer form, this is what is most important to us. But reality is that what should be most important is our hearts. And of course, when Allah and His Messenger when they refer to the heart, they're not talking about the physical heart in the body. Because that heart can be replaced. In 1967, Dr. Christian Barnard, he replaced the first human heart with another heart. That man lived for 18 days. And in 2001, Drs. Gray and Downling 
they replaced another man's heart. A man by the name of Robert Tools replaced his heart with a mechanical heart. And he lived for five months. So, when their hearts were changed, did they change? No. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu speak about the heart, they're speaking about the essence of the human being. The essence. The internal being. You. Not the physical, external. But you. Your essence. Your soul. And your soul resides according to the Quran and the Sunnah in the place of the heart and that's why it's referred to as the heart but not the physical thing because that may be confusing to you so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to be concerned about our souls ourselves but we have to take care of these selves and this is most important because otherwise this life becomes wasted and the life becomes wretched because Allah had said in the previous verses what I mentioned وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ whoever turns away from remembering me will have a wretched life one who doesn't look after his or her heart their life will be wretched they will never find happiness, real happiness. And this is what is happening in the society around us. When we look in the media, the media shows us certain individuals, singers, actors, and others who seem to have everything. Their lives are full with wealth and pleasure and fun and everything. But you hear about them killing themselves, taking drugs. Their lives are a mess. In spite of all of those things, the wealth, the beauty, how handsome, how beautiful they look, in spite of all of that, they still end up killing themselves, abusing themselves, harming themselves with drugs and these kinds of things. Why? Because their hearts were blind, blinded. Allah sealed their hearts because they turned away they turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they indulged in the forbidden things in evil, in sin and corruption then their hearts become darkened blind ultimately so instead for the believer for the Muslim, he or she should be concerned about their heart. Prophet Muhammad wasallam taught us a dua. A dua about the heart, which we all should learn. It was narrated by Umar, uh, Ibn Umar. The Prophet wasallam said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min qalbin la yakhsha, wa min dua'in la yusma', wa min nafsin la tushba'. وَمِنْ عِلْمٍ لَا يَنْفَعَ أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ هَؤُلَاءِ الْأَرْبَعَ O Allah, I seek refuge in you from a heart without the fear of God. A prayer unanswered, an unsatisfied soul, and knowledge of no benefit. I seek refuge in you from these four. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from a heart without fear. A heart which has no fear of Allah. That is the blind heart. It has no fear of Allah. It is not conscious of Allah. It is not guided by Allah in any way, shape, or form. As a result, one's heart that is blind when he or she makes dua, is Allah going to hear it? Is Allah going to answer that dua? No. Because the heart is blind. It's only going through the ritual. 
The person whose heart is not conscious of Allah, when he or she raises their hands in prayer, it is just a ritual. So it will not be answered. وَمِن نَفْسٍ لَا تُشْبَعْ And from the soul that is unsatisfied. What happens when the heart is blind? The soul can never be satisfied. It seeks satisfaction from the things around, like through drugs, through women, through wealth, through power, through all kinds of things, of the material things of this world. It will seek happiness through it, satisfaction, contentment. But will it reach it? Will it achieve it? No. That blind heart will never be satisfied. That's why the Prophet ﷺ has said that if the child of Adam were given a valley of gold, it would want another valley. Never satisfied. But real wealth is the wealth which is in the heart. As the Prophet ﷺ said, لَيْسَ الْغِنَى مِنْ كَثْرَةُ الْعَرَضِ Wealth, true wealth, is not from a lot of property. Kathratul Arad. وَلَكِنَّ الْغِنَى غِنَى nafs. However, true wealth is the wealth of the soul, wealth of the heart. The heart which is alive, which reflects, which sees and understands. That is the heart which is truly content. It finds contentment in this life. Satisfaction. Guaranteed. Furthermore, وَمِنْ إِلْمٍ لَا يَنْفَعَ The heart which is blind cannot benefit from knowledge. So Allah, the Prophet ﷺ told us to seek refuge from knowledge of no benefit, which is the consequence of the blind heart. Where when truth comes, the person cannot benefit from the truth. It is in, in opposition to the truth. So when one seeks refuge from the heart without fear of Allah, one is seeking refuge from all of this. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ closed the dua saying, أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ هَؤُلَاءِ الْأَرْبَعَةِ And I seek refuge in you from all four of these. So, if we are to understand what the blind heart is and how to cure it we need to know what are the signs of the blind heart based on what we have covered so far we can look at the signs of the blind heart let's see if we can get up the signs of the blind heart here the first sign of the blind heart is negligence of Allah it is a heart which is full of doubt not sure about Allah and about anything. It's the type of heart who easily is set on ease by the question, who created Allah? We're supposed to believe in Allah, but then who created Allah? That is the heart which is doubtful. It is not really conscious. You can't ask the question, who created Allah? Because Allah had no beginning. You can't create what has no beginning. You can only create something which has a beginning. So to ask who created Allah is a nonsensical question. It's a question which is ridiculous. Allah is the creator of everything. Or some people will say, out of negligence of Allah, I didn't ask Allah to create me, so why should I have to pray and all do all these other things? I didn't ask Him to create me. Have you heard that question before? You heard people say that? I didn't ask Allah to create me. Some people say that. This is again, signs of a blind heart. You don't want to die. 
You're happy that you're living, but you're not thankful to Allah that he brought you into this world. This is a doubtful heart. Negligent of Allah. Such a person, of course, salah, either he or she is not praying. They only pray when mom and dad says pray. If mom and dad are standing around, then they will pray. But if mom and dad don't see them and they're off with their friends, etc., no salah. Salah is only something that they do when somebody's around to order them to do it. That is negligence of Allah. If a person, if you feel that, then know that you have a degree of blindness of the heart. The second, I jumped around here somewhere. Oh, you're doing it. Okay. Admonition or advice has no effect. Admonition or advice has no effect. Meaning, people advise you to what's right. Do this. You shouldn't really do this. Has no effect. In fact, you dislike the truth. When people come to you the truth, you can't, you don't like to hear it. It's difficult to accept. You can't submit to it. Advice has no effect. Whether somebody told you don't do it or they told you do it, it's all the same. You're going to do it anyway. The third sign is no guilt or pain when sin is committed. No, that, that was a part of admonition. Go to the next one. No guilt or pain when sin is committed. Instead, pleasure and peace of mind. When the person does a sin, does what is haram, what is forbidden, they don't feel any guilt. They don't feel any pain. There's no, no feeling sense of wrongness there. And instead, what happens? They feel pleasure. Doing that sin, they only feel pleasure. And peace of mind, they feel good. That was nice. That is the sign, among the signs, of the blind heart. The fourth and last one which I'm mentioning to you is discomfort being in the company of the righteous and comfort in the company of the corrupt. Meaning when you're invited to be amongst good people, you feel uncomfortable. Oh, they're talking about stuff. They're talking about Islam. I don't really feel like being around them. No, I prefer to be with the other guys. We're talking about what? Talking about cars and women, drugs, having a good time, hip-hop, whatever, bop. Oh. That's among the signs of the blind heart. So we have to ask ourselves, to the degree that we have these four signs, major signs, and there are other signs. I'm only mentioning four of the major signs. The more of those signs we have, the more blind our hearts are. The less we have, the more our hearts are alive. So what is the cure? How do we cure these illnesses, these diseases that are blinding our hearts well there are four basic cures that we can look at the first cure is sincere remembrance of God to remember Allah sincerely either by dhikr, dhikrullah to say subhanallah Alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. To say these words of remembrance, which the Prophet ﷺ told us, say them understanding what they mean. 
saying them at the appropriate times. When we finish eating, Alhamdulillah. When we see something amazing, Allahu Akbar. When we see something which catches our attention, Subhanallah. So we use these phrases and we say them with meaning. We make them a part of our daily life. This is one of the ways of curing the blind heart. Also, dua. That we turn to Allah in sincere repentance. Turn to Allah, call on Him, be conscious of Him. Make dua which has meaning. Not just rattle off Arabic phrases and words, but actually think about what you're saying. Say it in your own language. Say it because you're communicating. We're talking about dua, not salah, but dua. Make dua after the prayers. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sincerely from your heart. Asking Allah to help you. We say it. Hidina sirat al mustaqim. Oh Allah, show us the straight path. We need to ask for it regularly. This will help to cure us of the negligence of Allah. And also the Quran. This is a part of remembrance of Allah. To read the Quran regularly. To read it and reflect on its meanings. Even just a little bit every day. In the morning with our families. Read the Quran. This will help us to remember Allah. It will help us to reflect on Allah. It is all a part of dhikrullah. The second cure. Second cure. Is... Righteous deeds. Do the good things that we know we should be doing. Do the right thing. In the different circumstances we catch ourselves in, try to do the right thing. And do it when people advise us, right? When people advise us to do good things, try to do them. In fact, we should go and seek out good deeds, good things, good actions, good words, and to do and to say them as much as we can. Because being good is what is required of us. Being good is what is required of us. Being bad, though it may make you popular, in some circles being bad, you're the hero. You're the baddest guy on the block right so you're the hero but really you've lost your way because success in this life will depend on how good you are failure will depend on how bad you are the third the third cure for the blind heart is Repentance and remorse. That you feel bad about what you did. Maybe the first time you did that bad thing, you're still feeling no guilt. But you stop yourself and say, hey, you know, this is not a good thing. I really shouldn't be doing it. Though you don't necessarily feel it in your heart, but if at least you try to stop yourself, tell yourself that it's not good. If you do it, more and more times eventually then your heart will come alive and realize and accept and reflect and know that what you're doing is not right so you repent to Allah you say astaghfirullah I seek your forgiveness O Allah and you say it reflecting and thinking about what you're doing Prophet Muhammad had said that we should seek forgiveness from Allah and that he himself used to do it more than a hundred times every day astaghfirullah astaghfirullah but when we do it we should think about what we are seeking Allah's forgiveness for not just to do it as a ritual astaghfirullah 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 
And if you keep doing that, you can do it faster and faster. It's stuck for loss, stuck for loss, stuck for loss, stuck for loss, stuck for loss. So you can finish off your hundred in a minute. But you didn't know what you said. And your heart wasn't in it. So there you're still in the blind state. For you to come alive, you have to think. You have to reflect. Your heart has to be involved in istighfar, in seeking forgiveness from Allah. And the fourth principle is to seek the company of the righteous. You have to change your company. If the people around you are not good, they're not encouraging you to be good. They are themselves blind. Their hearts are blind. Then you have to leave them. You have to go and find those who will help you to keep your heart alive. And help you for your heart to reflect. Because they are conscious. They are aware. This is the challenge. The challenge of overcoming the blind heart. As Allah said, فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Indeed, it is not the sight which becomes blind, but the hearts in the chest that become blind. I ask Allah to help us to clean up our hearts and bring them alive that they would reflect and remove the blindness from them. Protect us. Help us to protect our hearts. That is basically what I wanted to share with you this evening. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask, we have a few minutes to take a few questions. Like we have one written question here. Sheikh, you mentioned that the heart is not a real heart. No, the heart is a real heart. Right? The heart is a real heart. But I said the heart in these verses and in the hadith of the Prophet it refers to the location and not the physical heart. It's still real. The heart which means the soul is still real. The fact that angel Gabriel took out Prophet Muhammad's heart and cleaned it on two occasions doesn't mean that the heart which we spoke about here is different or that that heart is referring only to the physical as I said that spiritual heart the heart of us our core when you talk about you know um, you love somebody with all your heart I mean is it really that physical thing in there no but that is the location so if G angel Gabriel took out the heart and cleansed it the physical as well as spiritual this was a miracle a miracle by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was done through angel Gabriel you think anybody can take your heart out now cut it open and clean it clean it of sin well maybe if you have a lot of cholesterol it can clean out some of the things that are clogging it up for you but clean it of sin no or can they pour iman in it like angel Gabriel did into the heart of Prophet Muhammad no so what we're talking about as I said in the very beginning was not that physical organ pumping blood but the heart of the individual the core the soul the essence how do you know what sign or, or what signs tell you that Allah has forgiven you just know that if you are sincere if one is sincere in asking Allah's forgiveness then Allah will forgive you no matter how many times that we turn back to Allah, if we are sincere, He will forgive. That is certainty. If we are praying to Allah, not certain that He's going to forgive us, then 
our prayer of seeking forgiveness is going to be defective. When we pray to Allah, as the Prophet ﷺ said, Udu Allah wa antum muqinuna bil ijaba. You should call on Allah being certain that He answers your prayers. So when we turn to Him in repentance, we have to certainly believe that He will forgive us. Because if we don't believe that, if we have doubt about Allah's forgiveness, then we will not turn to Him sincerely. Um, question about a woman who every time she reminds her husband to go and pray he keeps saying inshallah inshallah you know there'll come a time when I will pray well that is not a good relationship because obviously it is not built on worshipping Allah and remember that the Prophet ﷺ had said that nikah, nisfuddin, that marriage is half of the religion. It is half of the religion. So that half is not being fulfilled in that marriage. So if that woman has tried and, and, and tried to encourage him and he still refuses to pray, then the best thing is to leave him. It's the best thing to leave him if he's not changing he's not making any effort just saying inshallah 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 things can only get worse anybody like to ask a question I think we have a microphone here you can come and ask Go ahead, there's a microphone. I don't know if I can hear you. Anybody would like to ask a question, just come up to the mic here. You can line up in front of the mic and ask the question. Or shout. What if you have like a Muslim friend and you tell him to pray with you, but he, does, he, say, he refuses? If you have a Muslim friend and you ask him to pray with you and he refuses well the best thing is to find out why try to find out why is he refusing so if he has some uh, mistaken idea then you try to correct that idea if he does know he should be praying and everything but he just doesn't want to pray then you need to find another friend Because remember, as uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, you will be raised on the Day of Judgment with your friends. Go ahead. How could a heart be blind? How can a heart be blind? Well, I think you weren't listening to the lecture. Can somebody explain for him how the heart can be blind, please? Somebody was awa awake in the lecture. How can your heart be blind? Huh? Can you explain how your heart can be blind? You're stretching? Uh, stretch with your hands down. Huh? Who's gonna, ex who's gonna explain to him how the heart can be blind, please? I want one of you all to explain. Huh? Okay, go ahead. 
Go to the mic. Explain to him how the heart can be blind. Like if you don't believe in Allah. If you don't fear Allah. If you don't fear Allah and like if you don't pray or do any of that sort of stuff and if you and you hang around with God like if you hang around with non-Muslim people. <laughs> All right. That's how your heart becomes blind. If you don't fear Allah, then you won't do the right thing. You won't be able to see the right thing to do. Okay? Question, if you want to make a, ask a question, just line up, just go to the mic and ask it. Anybody else wants to ask, just go and line up and take your turns. Go ahead. If you do not, if you do not like believe in Allah, will you like go to hell? Will you go to hell? Fire? Yeah, if you don't believe in Allah, yes, you will go to hell. Hmm. Next question, go ahead. What about if, um, if you had no time in school to pray? If you didn't have time at school to pray? Okay, um, if the school doesn't, you pray when you go home. If you didn't have a chance to pray at school, then you pray when you go home. Huh? If it's Asr time? If you didn't pray Dhuhr and it's Asr time, you pray your Dhuhr first and then your Asr. How about if there's a lot of better friends? Can you go closer to the mic, please? How about if there's not a better friend than the friend that doesn't pray? Like, if a friend doesn't pray... I can't pray, hear you still. You're talking... Put, go closer to the mic. How about if there's, an, uh, there's an, uh, like a friend that's not better than the friend that doesn't pray? Like there's a friend that doesn't pray, but the others are not better than him. If your friend doesn't pray, but the others are not better than him. Yes. If all the people around you don't pray, mm -hmm. is that what you're saying basically? Yeah. Well, you have to go find someplace else where people pray. Or you have to convince them to pray. You have to talk to them. You have to find out why they're not praying. You have to encourage them until you get some of them to pray with how about, you. How about if they don't want to? Huh? How about if they don't want to? Talk into the mic. How about if they don't want to? If they don't want to, then you have to find some people who want to pray and make them your friends. Um, as you were saying earlier in the lecture, um, you were saying something about how the son of Adam, if, even though if he had one valley of gold, um, he would want another. What yeah. do you exactly mean about that? Huh? What do you mean exactly? What do you mean by that? Yeah. Well, it means that you're never satisfied. If you had one valley of gold, you should say that should be enough for you. It should be enough. But no, when you have one valley of gold, you, you want another valley of gold. The meaning the more you have, the more you want. Right? Or they say the grass is always greener on the other side. You heard that before? Yeah. Yeah, that's what it means. Okay. That we're never satisfied. The more you have, okay, right now you want to have a motorbike. You get a motorbike, then you want to have a car. You get a car, you want to have an airplane, you know. After the airplane, you want to have a rocket ship, you know, whatever. You're never satisfied. Okay. That is how human beings are. Okay, next. Um, recently, I came across a hadith that says um, um, that... A brother shouldn't hit a Muslim brother in the face because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created man in, the for, um, in, his, own, in his form. Uh, I was wondering because my friend said that his is a pronoun going back to the man himself. I say that it's uh, actually going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning that Allah created human in the form of Allah, not resembling just... Um, in the same form, i.e., you can see, you can hear, so on. Uh, he insists that the pronoun goes back to man, and this uh, doesn't concur with the Quran that says nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I wish you, if you can clarify anything to this. Okay, um, uh, Sheikh Nasr Din al Albani, one of the leading Hadith scholars of uh, this century, he held the same position that the pronoun when it says Allah created Adam in his form that his form refers to the form in which he created Adam 
not in Allah's form. That this was his opinion and he brought other hadith to support that. And I believe also that is the strongest opinion. And when you went to a doctor appointment and you missed... The Pardon? Doctor, when, did, when did you go? When, when I went? When Speak it, into the mic, please. If you go to the doctor appointment and you miss Duhar and Asar, what is, and you come home at Aisha time, what did you do? If you go for a doctor's appointment and you, and you miss Duhar and Asar and Maghrib, and Maghrib that's a very long doctor's appointment. You must be having open heart surgery and brain surgery and everything all together to get that one in. <laughs> that's a serious surgery. No, I, I don't think that's too likely to happen really. You know, maybe you might, you might uh, miss your asr. Well, the point is what you, what you do is, if you know you're going to the doctor's office, it's gonna take a period of time in which you're going to miss one of your prayers, then you make the intention to join your prayers. Say, before you go to the office, to the doctor's office, it's like Zuhr time. So what you do is you pray Zuhr and Asr at that time, and then go. You understand? And if you know you're going to be delayed and miss Maghrib, then you make the intention to pray Maghrib and Isha together. You understand? Um, if, if you have a blind heart, are you going to go to hell? If you what? If you have a blind heart, are you going to go to hell? If you have a what? Blind heart, are you going to go to hell? A blind heart. Well, if you have a blind heart, you're on a road to hell. As long as you don't wake up and, uh, and see again then you will end up in hell but you can change it if these descriptions that I gave you of the blind heart if it matches you then no you can change it because there is a way to change it um, so don't give up my friend wants to know if if you're in a Somali tribe are you, is it haram? if you're what? <laughs> to be in a Somali tribe Tribalism. Tribalism. Yeah. Now, what do you mean? Huh? Ismaili what? Oh, the Ismaili sect. Tribe. Is there an Ismaili Hello? tribe? Hello? Is it haram to be on a tribe? Any tribe. Any huh? tribe. Right. Basically, apparently, the question is about tribalism. Tribalism. Yeah. Is it haram to be a part of a tribe, so to speak? Tribalism. Well, tribalism, yeah. where Within a person families. feels okay. that his tribe is superior to other tribes, you know, this is something hated in Islam. It is haram. Because we are all from Adam. Adam is our parents. The Prophet ﷺ said Adam is from dust. We're all the same. Okay, I'm just going to ask all the youngsters to uh, please. If the uh, question is having a tribe, as the brother is saying, no, having a tribe is like having a family. You know, the tribe is only an extended family. So everybody belongs to some family or some tribe. So there's nothing wrong with being within a tribe but when you start to feel that you are superior to others simply because you are born in this tribe or in this place this is what is haram If you make a mistake in Salah, what would you... Shh, the rest of you, please, can't hear the question. If you make a mistake in Salah, what do you do? If you... Make a mistake in Salah. 
If you make a mistake in salah, it depends on the kind of mistake. What kind of mistake? You pass wind? No. Like when you say subhanallah, you're supposed to say subhanallah, subhanallah al-azim, you say, you say something else. If okay, no, no, that, that kind of mistake. If instead of saying subhanallah rabbi al-azim, for example, you said subhanallah rabbi al-a'la, it's okay. That's all right. You catch yourself. It's not. It's only if you if you um, if you make a mistake where you forget a rakah. You know, you went from standing all the way down to sujood. You left out rukur, something like this. Then you have to repeat the uh, rakah, and at the end of it, you make two sujood, two prostrations for forgetfulness. Little mistakes are okay. It's all right. Um, if you're mistake in Quranic recitation, it's okay. Can you? Alaikum. Alaikum salam. Sheikh, um, what kind of nasiha would you give to parents that invoke uh, kufr standards onto their children, as far as uh, when it's appropriate to get married? What advice would I give to parents that invoke kufr standards onto their children, as far as when it's appropriate to get married uh, okay um, general advice is that when young people are able to get married they have the means or they uh, can get your su the support then they should be encouraged to marry uh, ma early marriage is something which is encouraged in the Sunnah. Prophet Sallallahu had said, "Ya ma'ashar al-shabab, man istata'a minkum al-ba'a, falyatazawaj." Oh, young people, whoever amongst you is able should marry. So this is something encouraged in Islam. And delaying marriage is really only asking for trouble. So my general advice to parents would be to encourage their youth to marry uh, younger, to avoid falling into boyfriend-girlfriend relations and other forms of corruption. Barakallah Um, Sheikh, um, I was asking um, if a young child, like an, a youth, can he have a blind heart? And if he does, will Allah forgive him more easily than a grown adult who has a blind heart? Um, a youth can have a blind heart, sure. Uh, but that heart, if he is not, if he's below uh, puberty, then it doesn't affect him. Once he reaches puberty, he reaches manhood, he becomes a young man now, then that blind heart is going to be counted against him. Right? Okay. Bye. Oh. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. One second, one second. Go ahead. Is it true that all Christians go to hell? Is it true that all Christians are going to hell? Yeah. No. No. It is not necessarily so. Not anymore is it true that all Muslims are going to paradise. Right? It depends on the person. If the person is a true Muslim, then he will go to paradise. If he's a Christian who believes that Jesus was God then of course he'll not go to paradise with that belief unless his situation was that he didn't receive the message and then Allah has another arrangement for those people who didn't receive the message Okay, this is a question. I think we're going to shift over now to the next program, uh, which is um, uh, bridging the gap between parents and, and youths. Before doing that, there's just a couple of questions from the uh, sisters. One similar to that last question, I heard that some of the people who are not Muslims and do not have access to find the truth have a chance of, to go to heaven. Is that true? Yes, it's true. Uh, as the Prophet had said on, that those people who didn't receive the message would be brought back before the final judgment 
and a messenger would be sent to them. Last question, when you are praying, the shaitan says bad things in your head.